so my name is Francis Mulango. Um, I'm actually an agriculture economist uh, at the African Center for Economic Transformation. But of course, uh, as an economist, you become interested to about just about anything. And uh, so this paper really, um, uh, well, the center, first of all, uh, we're a think tank based in Ghana uh, and uh, doing both research and policy advisory. And part of our research, um, we are preparing an index uh, on where we're going to measure African countries by the extent to which they have transformed. We call it the Transformation Index, uh, which will be uh, out very soon. Uh, so as we were sort of a, uh, and one of the components of this index includes um, uh, competitiveness and exports. And uh, so as uh, we were sort of developing it, I became a bit interested in export, sort of trying to understand why uh, firm export and some, some of what are, what are the drivers of export. And um, so I came across this, I guess, uh, uh, issue, uh, I guess endogenated issues where uh, on one hand uh, some literature says that um, investment causes exports, right? Or, and some says, you know, uh, it's actually firms who have access to export who actually would invest. So sort of the uh, and of course, you know, there's these literatures that sort of quoted them, very uh, high-level papers. And in a sense, what you have, you have the, your typical chicken and the egg problem that you have in just about any economics problem. Uh, but of course, uh, living in a world uh, or in a continent where we really need practical uh, policy uh, advice, uh, to gain further insight, you really need to, you know, really look beyond this chicken and the egg issue between investment and export, and sort of look at the, the, the factors, in fact, that influence the relationship between export and investment. So uh, some of the work that went beyond this uh, is uh, Brambilla, Lenderman, and Porto, who in fact said that uh, it's actually exporting per se is not what matters. It's actually the destination uh, of export. Uh, in a sense, if an African country or a developing country has to export to a rather more sophisticated market, the U.S., for example, uh, then the firm will make the investment in issues, uh, products such as skills, right? Because you need the skill to be able to produce the product that would require, that is required in higher level market. And of course, then there's also uh, people who argue that, well, it's also, you know, uh, of course, as you get exposed to these uh, more sophisticated market, then you make investment in, maybe you tend to import some of the inputs, or maybe you tend to import, to invest in actually the skills for invest for export. And, uh, but more, uh, you know, to, to sort of bring, bring these different aspects of investment and exports together, uh, Love and Rop Roper argue that, uh, so you have two elements. You have, on one hand, what they call internal enablers, uh, and on the other hand, you have external enablers. So external enablers include, um, you know, all the policies uh, or infrastructures put together by sort of the, the public office, you know, exporting zones, uh, uh, special industrial parks. These are some of the sort of what you, you know, what we call these cons conducive environment policies that would lead, at, you know, at least provide the avenue for firms to actually export or to, uh, to, to, to export. But what's actually most important are the internal enablers, which as the previous uh, speaker talked about, the skills of the management. Because you can put out all the policies you want out there. As he said, the you know, training is there, the knowledge is there. But if you have uh, management who are not well skilled enough to, and to know how to use the knowledge and make, turn it into profitable, uh, into profit, really, uh, there's really, uh, these external enablers may not have any impact, okay? And of course, um, you know, of course, there's no evidence of, not at least strong evidence of the role of these in, uh, internal enablers as, re as it relates to uh, sort of pushing firms to export, at least in Africa. So this is what, this is what led to uh, this um, research pro uh, topic. Uh, sort of the research question, obviously, is to look at, um, um, you know, to address the research gap that I just introduced and to, to estimate the impact of exports on firms' investment. 
uh, and evaluates the role of firm management skill in determining the impact of export on, an, uh, on investment. Okay? Uh, so, but of course, um, I'm looking at uh, particularly in Ghana, and, uh, and I'm using uh, Ghana's eligibility to AGOA, which I will explain later, as a way to instrument for export or access uh, or trade liber liberalization or access to a more sophisticated market as I early introduced. So just a bit about a really quick uh, illustration of the uh, manufacturing sector in Ghana because this is the example that I will use in this, uh, in this paper. Uh, the manufacturing uh, sector sort of uh, uh, accounts about 10% of the GDP in Ghana. Very, very small. And this is, in fact, what we expect for a typical African country. And in regards to the distribution of uh, the manufacturing sector, you have uh, sectors such as wood processing, which is really your typical, you know, anything but that from the timbering or to the typical uh, furniture making. <coughs> Uh, this very, very light manufacturing here. And of course, you have the, um, as he has been the case to many African countries, textile. Uh, this, this, I mean, this, I'm talking about this is back in the 1990s here, because these are the data that I will use for this analysis. Uh, and of course, then you have other industries, food processing, drinks, and so on and so forth. Um, and uh, the instrument that I will use to capture export is AGOA. Uh, this is. Uh, <coughs> This was an initiative introduced uh, by the U.S. in 2000 uh, to allow um, African countries to export their goods, you know, pretty much quota-free um, and duty, duty and quota-free to the U.S. And of course, a few countries were selected in 2000, uh, and Ghana was among one of them. Uh, and of course, today, um, so in the, today there's about 40 countries that, in fact, have the opportunity to export their goods to the U.S in a sense, quota free, uh, and, um, and it's on until 2015. At least this is its current expiration date. But then when AGOA came in, of course, um, in 2000, uh, it was, in a sense, unexpected, because uh, this is something that, uh, in a sense, Africa has never, had, had never seen before, uh, this sort of sudden access to this market at pretty much no uh, fees or no uh, tariff to pay. So, in a sense, it was what I would call here uh, a, a shock, a random event here, okay? Uh, and the data that I'm using here, um, this is a very popular data, uh, the regional project and enterprise uh, development data, uh, which really captures manufacturing firms in Ghana uh, between two, 1991 <coughs> and 2002. Uh, very, very solid data, looking at about 200 and, and plus firm uh, serve about 200 and plus firms and about a thousand or so employees within those firms over that period of time. And it really looked at the major cities, uh, namely, um, uh, of course, you have the capital city here, Accra, Kumasi, this is the, uh, the commercial capital. And uh, Takrade is also a major sort of um, manufacturing city. So it really targeted the main cities to serve all the, the, fir the firms. Uh, this is just to show the extent to which the fir I mean, the survey uh, is uh, represent it's nationally representative. Uh, so you have firms such as this is sort of the data from the data, and this is sort of the national representation. So you know, wood processing is among the big ones here. When you you add this furniture here, furniture making. So these these are sort of the uh, the sectors as illustrated by the by the um, the data. So I didn't. So these are the names that they gave them, and this is the names uh, given by the, uh, the sort of the, not the authorities in Ghana. Uh, so, <clears throat> so you have wood processing, and you have, of course, uh, the textile are among the top one. Uh, you know, sort of. You know, you have a clear representation from the data to, you know, uh, the national sort of data here. So, which tells us a bit about uh, the the robustness of the data that we're looking at here. And so what did that do? Uh, uh, so again, the, 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 uh, the objective is to look at the impact of exports on investment. So I use a typical difference in differences. So looking at uh, exports, I mean, um, looking at investment before and after uh, 2000. Uh, and of course, since I'm not using 
uh, I'm using non-random data here. I had to use some matching uh, uh, analysis here in order to reduce some of the biases. Okay? And, uh, and also, yeah, one caveat. The data that I'm using uh, does not say exporting firm X exporting to the US. It just says exporting in Africa, exporting outside of Africa. So there is a bit of, there might be some issues here of identification, which I will explain how it has been reduced here, at least minimized. Uh, just a better explanation of my identification, again, using a difference in difference analysis, looking at uh, 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 this is the outcome here. I will explain also shortly here. So pretty much investment in two, I two items. Uh, one, investment in plant and equipment. And the other one is investment in uh, accumulation of skill workers. So two types of investments here. I will run to two different analysis. And of course, um, I'm looking at, so like I say, AGOA came in 2000, okay? So the data runs from 1991 to 2002. So I'm looking at before 2000, okay, looking at the average before 2000 and comparing it 2000, 2001, and 2002. So in a sense, uh, my treatment variable is a rather dynamic one in order to capture firms that started to export after AGOA came in or stopped to export after AGOA came in, okay? So this is just to illustrate a bit of the model specification. Um, so now, I, I mentioned here that uh, the data uh, doesn't tell me whether a firm exports to the U.S. or not. It just tells me whether a firm exports outside of Africa or not, okay? So uh, now, this is just to justify a bit of that my, just my identification may be uh, less biased as one might think at first sight. Uh, so when we look at the share of, U of Ghana's exports, um, Ghana export, Ghana manufacturing export to the U.S. over the share of just total exports of Ghana, uh, we can see that between uh, 2004 and 2000 and 2004, in a sense, the year after AGOA, uh, and uh, and four years before, you can see that before after AGOA, the share was about 17 percent, but before it was about 7 percent. So in a sense, after AGOA, we can see that the share of uh, of Ghana manufacture export to the U.S. rapidly grew, okay? But more specifically, when you look at also between 2000 and 2004, uh, Ghana manufacturing export to the U.S. Uh, constituted, was about 25% of total Ghana manufacturing export, while before that it was about 10%, okay? And then lastly, uh, Ghana manufacturing export outside of Africa. When you look at Ghana manufacturing export outside of Africa, after 2000, between 2000 and 2004, it grew by about 34%. But then when you remove uh, sort of the, 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 the exports, the US, it actually uh, reduced or uh, grew by minus 43%. So again, the growth that we saw in Ghana manufacturing between 2000 and 2004, the year after AGOA, can be in fact identified to AGOA here, okay? Uh, of course, um, the typical issue is that uh, the, tr the, the decision, the, 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 our treatment variable here, which is exporting outside of Africa, can be biased here. So in a sense, a firm may decide to export for other reasons. So uh, we control for that, uh, that, uh, that, that uh, pot potential uh, bias here. Uh, so in a sense, we use it, one of those, the typical two-stage least square fixed effect model to control for some of that. And uh, so the first stage, in a sense, just looked at the determinant of exporting outside of Africa. And some of the, the strong ones are just your, your, your real outputs, the value of your real outputs, and of course, your costs. And one good one is also the number of skilled worker, right? Which is what we, in a sense, anticipate as far as the determinant of exporting in outside of Africa, which I, I quote as more uh, sophisticated markets here. And so now, uh, so here are some of the main results. Um, so the first one here, so all it did is simply looked at the impact of exports on uh, firms' investments in uh, plants and equipment, okay? So like I said, uh, this is the average data. So sorry if it's a bit fuzzy here. Uh, what we see is an interesting scenario here. So this is in 2000, 2001, and 2002. 
So I looked at the three years after Agoa, 2000, 2001, 2002. What we see in the first two years is disinvestment. So after Agoa, firms disinvest in their plant and equipment, but then in the third year, then they start investing, which tells me something about, uh, so they wanted to get rid of maybe old technologies and then to have enough money to invest in new technologies. Okay, so this is looking at just the aggregate data. Then when you break it down into by, by firm intensity, so light, medium, and um, heavy manufacturing, of course you see the same trend here with light manufacturing, whereas the first two years there's a disinvestment, and then of course the second year there is investment. Uh, for, oh, well, it's issue here, but uh, what it is is uh, in fact, uh, it's insignificant here, or at least it's significant only with uh, the third year. So, and then, of course, for heavy manufacturing, uh, for heavy manufacturing, uh, there is nothing. So, in a sense, the investment that we see. Uh, yes, you have a question. Just the investment spending on the investment. Say it again, please. Are you looking at the investment, the total spending, or the? Investment? I'm I'm looking at the inv the, inf the, inv the the value of investment, the real value of the investments. Say it again, please. It's not normalized. It's real. It's in, in real term. Yes. Yes. Okay. So what we're seeing uh, here as far as the impact of, of export on investment on equipment and, 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 and plants are in fact driven by, by light manufacturing. Okay. But then when we look at, uh, now we look at the impact of still this export, but now we're looking at uh, the accumulation of skilled workers, right? Uh, on average, we see uh, the impact starting to kick in after, from 2001 and 2002, okay? But for the case of light manufacturing, there's nothing. Uh, for the case of medium manufacturing, we see something in 2001, but of course, for the case of heavy manufacturing, there is a, uh, a heavy investment in it. So in a sense, what, in terms of the impact of exports, on, um, on accumulation of skilled worker on an aggregate. It's mostly driven by heavy manufacturing firm. Okay? So now, the, the, the main question is, what is firm management has to do with this? Because this is, again, the, the main question here. So what I did is I broke it down these impacts, because these, these ones are impact. I broke them down by firm sectors and by firm size. Okay? So then I run a, uh, a few non-parametric uh, regressions here <clears throat> to look at how the impact, okay? So the first one is just looking at how the, this impact of exports on firm investment in, on plants and equipment correlates with uh, two, el two elements here. Educational manage management and the job tenure or how long the manager has been in the company, okay? So, uh, we see at least a upward trend here. This the first one is with education. In other words, uh, education is sort of there's a positive correlation with uh, education of top management and the impact of trade of or exports on investment on equipment and plant. But for the case of job tenure, it's a bit downward uh, in a sense. Firm managers who has been around for a long time tend to be a bit conservative, okay? But for the case of um, the impact of exports on um, skill accumulation, we don't really see a, a, a trend here to really bring in any, any, any viable conclusion here. All, all we can say is that for the case of uh, firm manager who have uh, about 20 years or so of education, you have a, just a big bump. But other than that, really, there's really no trend here to really tell a story here, okay? Uh, just to bring the message home, um, so the impact of export on firm skill worker uh, accumulation uh, and firm uh, real investment in planting equipment is positive. However, this, of course, this impact varies by manufacturing intensity, such as that, um, Investment in plant and equipment were mostly made by firms in light manufacturing, whereas um, the accumulation of skilled worker was made by um, firms in both medium and heavy manufacturing. So then while um, level of management education is positively correlated with impact of trade and plant, 
on plant and ma uh, machinery investment, tenure tends to be a bit negatively correlated. Okay? Um, just uh, quickly, um, just uh, uh, in terms of really policy recommendation from this exercise, um, Ghana has implemented a lot of policies in regards to sort of uh, promoting uh, trade. Uh, one of them is the, uh, the EDF fund, the fund to provide sort of a, a, a interest free or inter low interest uh, loans to firms, to, exp to exporting firms. But an interesting one is what uh, we call, they call the, uh, the Export Development Center. Uh, no, no, the Ghana Industrial Skill Development Center. This is this policy there, this institution there, to <coughs> enhance the skills of workers. So in a sense, to address these uh, uh, issues with uh, sort of the internal enablers. Uh, it's not yet, so, um, so it's there. Oops, sorry. Um, and so in, in a sense, regarding setting it up, you know, um, the way it works is um, the government uh, selected a small number of its technical polytechnic schools, institutes, and sort of took them out of the, the regular uh, educational system and sort of, uh, and, you know, engaged them with the industry. So it's located in one of the major industrial sector in Ghana and mostly geared toward the textile industry. So a similar model can be replicated in other African countries in order to sort of help and end sort of this uh, internal enablers such as firm management skills and so on and so forth. And so what is the impact of this? We don't know yet. It's a new policy and maybe a research topic for some of you. Thank you.